Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Atri Indresen. I'm with uh, Cisco Systems. I first presented in uh, FaucetCon 2017, and that was really early days for us, a uh, bit of you know, uh, where we stood at that time, and there's a bit of promise of the, of the future over there. Um, I'm here today to <clears throat> share what we have done since then. Um, we have had certain accomplishments from, uh, from our team, and um, let's talk about where we are and where I think we should be going. OK. So just broad outline of the talk. I'll talk very briefly about um, uh, what we have in our platform and then get into some of the technical details of various features. So um, the Catalyst 9000, we enabled, oops, don't go on the own. Uh, enabled uh, the faucet open flow uh, pipeline. So this is just one reference pipeline, but uh, with the TFM, you can do uh, what you want. We do have other um, uh, kinds of programmability uh, to manage the device, uh, open config, GNMI, GNOI, and uh, things like that. So uh, what's, uh, oops, all right. So just to give you an idea, um, this is in production. So our first official release was ISXE 16.9.1, which was in August of 2018. And we do a release pretty much every four months like clockwork. So we get in new features as uh, needed. We do have an estimate of about 4,000 odd switches, both fixed and modular, deployed in enterprises. Uh, some of them are running faucet. Some of them are running proprietary controllers. Um, we also enable certain hybrid features, which are beyond open flow. I'll talk about that in more detail later, like LLDP for POE. Uh, the other thing is we are open to suggestions for new features and capabilities. Uh, as I said earlier, we enabled faucet, not really open flow. So it is a subset of everything that open flow 1.3 does. So on a case by case basis, and we had this discussion during the panel, discussion earlier this morning. This is the community that decides how we move forward uh, across vendors, and we define what OpenFlow looks like in the enterprise and in the future. So this is what the um, Cisco switching portfolio looks like. So if you look at everything in the top line, uh, we start with the Catalyst 9200, 9300, etc. So we start from really low end to high end uh, copper, optical, all the way up to 100 gig uh, interfaces. And uh, OpenFlow currently is supported on the 9300, 9400, and uh, the two kinds of 9500 that we have over there. Across this entire product line, we do have uh, architectural consistency, same family of ASICs, uh, same operating system, et cetera. So you'll get a very consistent look and feel. So to give an idea, so um, we use an internal proprietary ASIC called the UADP, or the Unified Access uh, Data Processor, also called Doppler. So you'll hear both words. Um, it is a programmable pipeline. So the abstraction matched pretty well with what we needed for uh, OpenFlow with flexible match and actions. Uh, it's compatible with Fawcett. We support TFM. And uh, the nice thing is, given that the ASIC is programmable, if you want new features, sometimes even increasing scale, it's a change in software. You don't need to change the hardware at all. So if you're to look at the platform summary, you can see the uh, types of uh, use cases that we have, whether it's uh, fixed or modular, copper or optical. But in terms of features and functionality, today, all of them support up to 16 tables, 128 priority levels. These numbers can be changed if needed. Like I said, it's a software change. Uh, the number of flows is more hardware related, uh, but uh, we have uh, ways by which we can increase the number right now. Yeah, 40 and 100 gig ethernet, 10 gig ethernet uh, are, no, 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 it's, everything's ethernet. OK, so uh, switching gears slightly, let's talk about the table feature message and how we manage flexible pipelines. So 
this is a figure that uh, everyone has seen more times than they care to remember. Uh, so that's our abstraction. And what does that really mean? So it really comes down to what do you really have in your pipeline? What are the capabilities of your ASIC? And um, is the ASIC fixed? Is there some flexibility? How flexible is it? How many pipeline stages do you have? And uh, what kind of operations can you do in each pipeline stage? Are all of them the same? Are some of them different? And uh, here's a very general statement. With a sufficient number of recirculations, a fixed pipeline could emulate a flexible pipeline. So even if, uh, so let's just take a, a, an example. So this is some public documentation I found on the Broadcom uh, Trident 3 pipeline. So you can see that it's got three programmable uh, ingress pipeline stages. And um, it's got some egress pipeline stages, which we don't use in uh, at least in OpenFlow 1.3. So depending on how many tables you have, we need to go through a sufficient number of recirculations. And if some of the table stages have different capabilities, maybe more than what the number of tables might have required. Um, the other thing to look at is um, Broadcom had the OFDPA, and they created certain abstract switches for different use cases, and they mapped them onto their particular hardware. That can be fairly challenging to use in real life if you want to do something like faucet, because faucet pipeline is similar to what they had and not quite the same. Um, uh, Chris Loria is not here, but uh, he did some really interesting work on mapping uh, faucet onto different pipelines. He did some with P4, but here's a fun one with OFDPA. And I recommend people take a look at that paper. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, good information. And you can just see the spaghetti that he had to go through to make anything work uh, over there at all. And, uh, and if you look at the notes he had along with this figure, he, the bunch of caveats. I had to do this, this, this outside. Otherwise, it doesn't work at all. And in my uh, conversations with um, other vendors over here who are using um, Broadcom, uh, they all agreed with me, said, oh, OFDPA is not really useful, and they go and program the ASICs directly and use their forwarding stages. So that's the right way to go. Um, OK. So um, just as a matter of record, from our point of view, it's very straightforward. You get a TFM. Table 0 goes to pipeline stage 0. Table 1 goes to pipeline stage 1, and so on. When we run out of pipeline stages, we will recirculate the packet. And that's it. So our architecture is really simple. Uh, like I said, it is consistent across uh, the various generations of uh, ASICs that we have. Um, we have UADP 2.0, 2.1, 3.0, and a whole bunch of things in, in the future. Um, during development, uh, we uh, test every feature across all the ASICs, whether we have silicon or not. So we have simulation models. For them, so we are fairly future-proof. As new platforms come along, it'll be relatively straightforward to enable it over there. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is what we have in the table feature message: how many tables, what's the size of each tables, how do you want to do the match, and what kind of actions that you want to do. So, and this is exactly what I said: just one by one, assign them, and you're you're all done. It's not complicated. Uh, OK, so um, kind of semi done with uh, OpenFlow at this, uh, this point. One of the things that uh, we realized pretty quickly while working on, on the switch, people want to do things once in a while which don't fit in neatly in the OpenFlow paradigm. And uh, when we started on this, uh, we were given fairly explicit requirements from a customer saying, no hybrid behavior. It must be an open flow switch. You just do open flow. Everything is managed by the controller. By and by, certain use cases came along and said, oh, we can't do this in open flow, which is not a bad thing, but let's talk about some of them. So definitions. Native behavior is that which is fully specified by the open flow pipeline the data plane, the protocol, everything like that. 
hybrid behavior relies on certain switch capabilities. So we had a discussion earlier today about certain one aspect of hybrid behavior, which was the control plane network. And uh, the general consensus was, yes, we need to have an out of band interface. If you want to have in band connections to the uh, open flow controller, do so with great care. Okay. So one of the nice things that OpenFlow has is that you can redirect packets to the switch CPU. And you just have an action which says output to local. So that's part of the OpenFlow protocol. And once you deliver a packet to the switch CPU, you can do with it what you want. So that is our basic construct to handle any kind of uh, hybrid behaviors. And um, we enable them based on use cases. So the Catalyst OpenFlow uh, software image is identical to our general image. So person buys a Catalyst switch, you download software off uh, the Cisco website, and you configure OpenFlow, and you're all set to go. So either the switch will do OpenFlow or it will do traditional switching. You don't need to change the image. So in theory, if I were to send, um, let's say, an OSPF packet to the switch CPU, maybe it'll run the protocol. You should not enable it. It's not a good idea. Okay. So enabling local actions is on a case-by-case -case basis based on what you really want to do. So um, uh, let's take a look at um, LLDP Med and Power over Ethernet. So uh, LLDP Media Endpoint Discovery is an extension of LLDP, and it allows you to do various things, uh, auto discovery of the LAN policies, inventory management, where the devices are, et cetera. Uh, what was really interesting over here is how do you manage power over Ethernet? So uh, LADP Med has certain TLV extensions which allow you to negotiate power back and forth. So what do we do? Match on an LLDP packet instead of have a rule which says punt to controller, we say punt to controller and punt to local. So one copy goes to each place. Uh, so the controller wants to do any kind of inventory management, discover topologies, whatever else they want to do with LLDP, works fine. Uh, in the meantime, the CPU parses the LLDP packet, says, oh, there's a request over here to set a power level. Can I handle it? It decides all of that and uh, sends a message back saying, yeah, you got 10 watts or whatever else they asked for. So um, th this is kind of nice because otherwise you need to provide some kind of an out of band mechanism if uh, uh, we would need to have the controller do the power negotiation. And after that, maybe there's some kind of an open config message or some other out of band management function you can do to set the power level. But over here, hey, you already have the function, enable it. All you need to do is in the CLI say, OK, I'm enabling LLDP functionality on the switch or CDP or whatever else it is. So uh, if someone wants to do something locally on the switch, ask us first. Uh, we don't want to have accidents, but it should be fine. OK. Uh, the, the next one which uh, we are working on, so we have a prototype which is working, is um, Maxec. So uh, again, Maxec is not part of the um, OpenFlow protocol. Uh, so you, you have an encryption decryption module in the Mac, so any traffic over the wire gets uh, encrypted, and the different encryption algorithms, 128 and 256-bit MacSec, et cetera. And in terms of negotiating the keys, there is a um, protocol called MKA, MacSec Key Agreement. So there's a couple of ways of doing this. One is we can implement MKA on the controller, and so the controller, <laughs> thinks it is two different switches, and it handles both ends of the negotiation and then tells the switch, OK, go and program these keys. Instead, we have this functionality again. It's not really necessary to teach a controller how to do these things. You say, if I get an MKA BPDU, send it to the local CPU, negotiation happens, and this just works. So uh, we're not just shipping this feature, but it's working in the lab, and we should have it pretty soon. OK. Where do we go from here? So um, 
again, same discussion we had this morning. We are going to do what this community asked for. So we are uh, committed to OpenFlow, more particularly to Fawcett. And so if there are use cases, talk to us, and we are happy to discuss it with you and do what we can. Having said that, just a few thoughts, a few proposals. Um, we need to think more in terms of um, network architecture and solutions rather than point features. And um, I think Bob brought it up in this morning. Hey, uh, we have redundant paths. How do we handle that? Can we do a multi-path, either layer two or layer three? Um, we want to implement some kind of a fabric using uh, OpenFlow. What's that fabric going to look like? Uh, we don't need to do a full-fledged VXLAN. Is there a, a lightweight mechanism which will work across uh, different uh, faucet switches? Um, I think segmentation uh, is also an important uh, uh, feature. Uh, today, you can segment traffic using VLANs, but that's about it. Uh, it would be nice to have some kind of, let's say, routable segmentation goes along with the multipath. And the other question is, how do we handle identity and policy? Are we going to have ACLs which say, OK, this IP address or this MAC address can do this or that? Or is there some way to classify capabilities and map that into some kind of a scalable canonical identity? And we can express policies in terms of that. So the moment you're talking about policies, which go beyond packet fields, we're probably looking at some form of metadata. So again, that's that. I think that's a discussion that we need to have. So, anything, an ACL, let's say a role-based ACL of some kind. Um, uh, uh, authorization. Uh, the switch really doesn't care about it because we had the presentation earlier today, uh, you, you can have Chewy or anyone else. Um, uh, you, you can have ICE or we, we can integrate third party services with Fawcett and that's the correct way to do uh, authentication. And maybe they can also send down some data which map onto identity and we can create classification rules based on that. And uh, can they also, send down um, uh, certain policies, security policies, based on these identities. It's, it's an open question. It's, um, it would, we can, I think we can leverage a lot of open, what OpenFlow has to offer uh, to make this happen, but uh, it's a longer term discussion. Again, like I said, I'm throwing this out. What would people like to do? Okay. So, yeah, that's as much as I have. Um, just, uh, you know, this is not one person's work. There are many, many people who have uh, worked on this and written code and tested for this. Uh, most of the people are here uh, in this room. So I want to say thank you to uh, everyone. Um, it's been an interesting journey. We started in November of 2016 and um, uh, we have about four or five major releases in at this point of time. Product gets better. We have added platforms. It's been fun. Okay. Yes, sir. How much, if at all, do you talk to customers? Um, that's a good question. Um, a fair amount. Um, uh, let, but let's say the number... We don't have many customers, right? It's still a very new uh, technology. Uh, uh, very often, you know, maybe Brad reaches out to me about something or some other customer comes to us. Um, so the engagement right now very often is directly with the engineering team. We don't have that much. We are still working on a better support model where we can have TAC or advanced services offload some of these things, but uh, by and large, the contact is directly with the engineering team when things uh, have to be done. Yeah. So, um, Connie, uh, Brad talked about, you know, there's a um, uh, often there's maybe a room that's very flexible. 
flexible thing to go to work for people or and there may be a, a lighter weight uh, solution of uh, devices. I did add some things that now are having to be done by working outside in some mm -hmm. way, outside of the thing. Do you have a, a vision for where we may go? Is it an evolution of OpenFlex? Is it also tries to come up with a new South Bend interface as a community? Um, I, I would say no. Um, so let's uh, take a couple of steps back. Um, when I first looked at OpenFlow years ago, just for fun, and my first impression was, hey, this stuff is actually fairly complicated. And it's relatively straightforward to do in software, but the amount of flexibility you have makes it very difficult to do this in hardware. And this is a regular conversation which I've had with uh, Josh and Brad. It always starts with, thank you for simplifying OpenFlow, right? Now we can actually do it relatively easily in hardware. And I, and I think that was their original goal. Uh, you, you, you can just play with something in the lab with software models for just so long. But now we have a useful subset of OpenFlow that you can do. So, and I, I think uh, Brad also more or less said the same thing in the morning that we need to be careful about adding new features to OpenFlow because we don't want to leave behind some platforms. So yeah, some, we have a fairly programmable platform, so we are quite confident, but then again, we recognize this is, hey, this is what the community wants, this is what the community desires. Now, um, the other things I talked about, so MaxEc is definitely outside OpenFlow. So that goes without saying. Uh, anything in the device management, uh, we have to use other methods. So open configs also definitely a good way to go. They're, they're complementary. So almost anything related to the data plane, we should keep that within the bounds of OpenFlow to the extent that we can. So it's kind of questionable. Yes, MaxSec is in the data plane, but it's kind of beyond because you go to the Mac and then you encrypt the packet and it goes out. But um, let's put it this way. Any forwarding related function for the most part should be within OpenFlow. Anything else? So this is a very broad statement. I'm sure we can slice and dice it and come up with a better definition, but very broadly, Management functions, et cetera, can come from somewhere else. But if it's forwarding related, let's try to keep it within uh, OpenFlow. Yeah. So that's a fairly example. I think it's really interesting. Data plane. You can't like put all that in a low profile. Negotiating the power level. Yeah. But then you've got you know, setting the power level report, to, which to me doesn't seem like something that's going to happen on kind of an RTT time scale. It seems much more the open yeah. Side of things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is, is that a sensible way to slice it? Because it seems it does seem that if you want to implement that outside the box, you end up with something that's kind of a NFT. I mean, you can certainly set the right architecture. Um, as I mentioned, you you can go either way uh, on this, and um, it's let's put it this way: it's very convenient to do it on, on the switch because there's always certain uh, nuances. Uh, if, let's take an alternate model. Let's say you have open config. So whoever's the NFV needs to go to the switch and query them and say, oh, how much power do you have to distribute? Uh, give me your inventory of interfaces. How many of them are PoE enabled? And uh, then uh, they need to be informed every time, uh, let's say, some kind of a supplicant comes and says, hey, I want power. So I agree. Uh, you're not going to plug in these devices so frequently, so maybe you can wait a few seconds or you know, hundreds of milliseconds, as much time as it takes. It's not a big deal. But uh, th this is a function which already exists on any switch which does BOE. And so it's... a trivial extension from an open flow perspective and saying, hey, if I want to enable LDP PoE, I just add one more open flow rule that says, hey, CPU deal with this. So whether it's the right abstraction or not, it's very implementation dependent. But uh, uh, 
the, the reason to have an NFV is maybe you want to explore a more global policy. Uh, maybe it has an additional feature like, does this person really deserve the power? It's not just a question of whether it's available. Now that's a more complex question, which probably the switch cannot do. So there's no reason it can't be done the other way, right? You just need to provide an open config model to, uh, to query the switch power capabilities and to set them on a per port basis. But uh, for the kind of thing that we want to do right now, this is easy. And you know, we, we have all kinds of fairly complex capabilities built into PoE. It's the power level, it's the power priority. Uh, when you reboot the switch, uh, we actually have a way of remembering the last power drawn on a particular port. Then you come up, it, the device gets powered on immediately or even while it's rebooting. After all, the power supply is still there. So you don't suddenly turn off lights just because I'm rebooting your uh, your PoE switch. So they, uh, I, I think this is the kind of things vendors can do in terms of a value add. And uh, it's not clear to me that an NFV will want to try and customize it. Because if you want to have something like um, an OC model, yes, you can specify everything you want and you can negotiate capabilities, et cetera. But very often you come down to least common denominator approach. Two last points. One is that this is actually more effective. Yeah. Than a yeah, you don't have to, yeah. Okay. The other thing is that if you really get the data strength, right, I mean, what does the customer expect? They, I mean, when you look at an iPhone or whatever, battery management, atomic charger, if you use whether you, whatever technology that you use, it does not matter. Customer does not want to set any parameters. Whether you call it AI, ML, whatever it is, it's all magic. So, I would say principle probably yeah. magic. Yeah, just as a broad statement, this is software. So, there's always more than one way of doing it. So, what works for the end users is. That's the right answer. Any more questions? Thank you, everyone.